Please join me in welcoming Mayor Eric Johnson. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, thank you for being here. I'm going to decline to shake your hand for fear that Vice President Pence will bust through the back That's door, good point. actually. <laughs> good point. Yeah. Good point. Come on, sit down. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll get started. Thank you so much for joining us. And I want to actually go there in all seriousness. I want to talk about the coronavirus. Um, because I figure as the mayor of the <clears throat> third largest city in Texas, ninth largest in America, 1.3 million people. And counting. And counting. Serviced by the fourth largest airport in the world in DFW, an estimated 75 million people will pass through That's DFW right. Airport this year, arriving, departing, and connecting. Don't you have a public health crisis just fixing to happen in the city of Dallas? Well, I certainly hope not. I hope we don't, but we're prepared if we do have a case of the coronavirus that appears in Dallas. So let me, I guess, give you an update on where we are. Please. Um, there have been no known cases of the coronavirus in the city of Dallas or in Dallas County. So we don't have any cases right now. But in the event there were to be a suspected case of the coronavirus, we actually have some precedent for dealing with a pandemic situation in that we dealt with the Ebola situation in Dallas. Some of you may, re may remember that. So unfortunately, uh, this isn't our first rodeo in Dallas when it comes to this. So we have some very well-developed um, communication structures and, and working groups in place between the city of Dallas and Dallas County. And, and those of you may know that public health and dealing with um, these types of situations is primarily a county responsibility And I remember, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, 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 Mayor, uh, that uh, Judge Jenkins was instrumental in the plan that Dallas put into place with the Ebola issue. Have you engaged uh, Judge Jenkins in a conversation yet about what happens in the event of? So this, this, our offices have been in contact right. about making sure, first and foremost, that our first responders, specifically Dallas Fire Rescue, which is actually a city office, right. uh, it's under the the it reports up to the city manager of Dallas. Um, we want to make sure that our first responders know and are reminded and have been uh, retrained and, and know from the Ebola situation that when they are responding to a potential case, that they are to go with protective gear and they are to call the Dallas County Health Department first to make sure that we know exactly what we are supposed to do. And those right. instructions are coming directly from CDC. So we're getting instruction from CDC that's coming to the county, that's coming to the city as to how to handle a suspected case. Right, no, but, th but those are procedures for people who are professionals working this pandemic yes. should it become necessary. What are you communicating to the citizens of Dallas or the citizens of Dallas County? Because my concern as a citizen of Texas is less about whether government is gonna do its piece. I'm really more concerned about whether there's gonna be a panic and right. people's behavior is going to change. And we'll get to the economy in a second, but I think the, the, the downstream consequences of this are really first and foremost in my mind. Right, well, no one should panic. Everyone should go about um, their, their normal lives, but I would say that there are three things you should definitely do. Um, and we are, we are doing everything we can. I think we've done a good job so far of not contributing to any sense of, of panic because in essence, um, we have been down this road before. We, we, in Dallas, we, we know what we're supposed to do if we get a situation where we need to quarantine someone and we need to go through do that you, procedure. Do you feel like, Mayor, but, you, you fully understand the, 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 I guess maybe what I'm trying to get at is do you fully understand, do we fully understand the extent to which we should be worried? I'm expressing a sincere and emphatic not to worry don't message. Be, don't you be don't worried. need to worry. Right. What you need. This is to, not like Kevin Bacon no. at the end of Animal House. Yeah. What you oh. all what, is well as he's being run I, I over. Right? So, yeah. I can't. I can't be more emphatic about this, and I can't. I can't be more emphatic about this, and I can't be more sincere when I say yeah. what you need to do, and this is all you need to do at this point, <laughs> is to make sure if you feel sick, don't go to work, don't go to school, stay home. Right. Wash your hands, and probably the most important thing you can do, which we've been promoting in Dallas right now is to don't lose sight of something that is actually statistically harming more Americans every year than, than, the, than this virus, the coronavirus, and that's the flu. Get a flu shot. If you haven't gotten a flu shot, it's not too late. Get a flu shot. Okay. Stay at home if you're sick. <clears throat> right. And that should help. Are you getting good information from the CDC? I'm sorry to have to ask that question. <laughs> But I have now heard the president say a couple of times uh, now, uh, two days in a row, that there are only 15 
uh, cases of the coronavirus in this country and that they're dropping down. There are more confirmed cases of the coronavirus, in fact, more than double that number in California alone, according to Governor Newsom. So I want to know, are you getting accurate information that you can then pass on to us in your mind? Well, I certainly hope so. We have no reason to believe yeah. that it's not accurate. And like I said, um, at this point, Dallas County, city right. of Dallas, um, no, no reported cases. And we are confident that if we did have one, uh, we know what to do. Okay, so let me ask you about the economic impact, which is, is kind of more of an on the ground situation. We know what the stock market has done <laughs> over the last three days, and it has just yeah. opened. <clears throat> and the expectation was that it was gonna open actually several hundred points down when it did <clears throat> as a result of this. Um, there are more than 27 million people who visit the city of Dallas every year. They spend $5.2 billion. They generate a total economic impact of the region of $8.8 .8 billion. This is not immaterial. If, that sounds if, good to if, me. If, you got some good if, numbers there. Evan. But, but if tourism drops off, you know, there's a discussion about South by Southwest in a couple of weeks, which will be here in the city of Austin. There are people who are calling for South by Southwest to be canceled. South by Southwest is not So that's the kind canceled, of thing we don't, you know, we, we but, don't But the that. point is that, if, you know, I'm hearing on the radio, Facebook is pulling out of a conference in California. This other company is pulling out of a conference here. Are, are your tourism dollars, is your economic impact at risk as a consequence of this for legitimate reasons or not? No. I mean, again, there is no reason for people to change their daily activities and their daily lives at this point. Right. Well, you say that. And I hear you, but you know that people sometimes react irrationally to the situation. I mean, look that, at the, look at the stock that, market. That's yeah. exactly what it would be. It would be at this point, it would be, would be irrational. it would be an irrational response. Look, look at the stock market. I looked up this morning pretty early the largest public companies in Dallas. I was curious to see how their stock prices had had uh, dropped over the last week because the market is down significantly. Exxon stock is down from sixty dollars to fifty dollars, about a fifteen percent drop in the last week. McKesson stock is down one hundred and seventy to one hundred and forty eight. American Airlines stock is down 20%. Southwest Airlines stock is down almost 20%. These are four of the largest public companies. In our area. And they're in your area. And that, and I could go on. Does that concern you? Well, I mean, I, I, I can't be concerned about the stock prices of corporations that are located in our area. I have to be right. concerned about the economic viability of these But companies. you understand the reverberating yeah. impact of that in your community. If the stock price is down, if these companies are somehow at some- They're, 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 they're not, know. they have not become financially endangered because their right. stock prices are, are in, in momentary of flux. Of course. Um, but what I'm trying to <laughs> emphasize to you yep. is that we are contributing to the extent that we um, don't tell people the facts, which are there are no cases of this in, in Dallas at all. And if there were, yeah. we actually have precedent for how to deal with this. And our people are being trained and reminded of what right. we've done before. So I'm, I want people to have confidence that we are doing everything we can and yeah. that we're supposed to be doing um, from the standpoint of the government and that there are things that they can do. And namely, again, staying home if they're sick and washing their hands right. and those types of basic things. Getting a flu shot would be a great thing to do as well. Mr. Mayor, you know that I asked you to do this conversation with me several months yes. ago before we even knew the word <laughs> coronavirus. So of yeah, course that true. wasn't the intent here, but what was the intent was to try to talk to you about a bucket of issues that fall in your area that actually are much larger than what you would expect a mayor or a right. city to have to deal with. Right. Uh, Rahm Emanuel, who was the former mayor of Chicago, actually has a book out this week called The Nation City about the power of mayors and the role of mayors in, and cities in litigating these global issues. And this is something that Mayor Emanuel writes in the book. The federal government is distant, the local government is intimate. The federal government is dysfunctional, the local government is impactful. Federal government is indifferent. Local government is immediate. Local governments are politically stable when our national governments are anything but. Pressing questions are being asked today of our national governments by the citizens of the world. The answers to those questions are found in cities and with their mayors. His point is, you all have never had more power at the municipal level to deal with this big bucket of issues like the coronavirus and some others we'll talk about than you do now. You agree? Well, I think that what he's really getting at there, and I think he's right about this, is that more and more responsibility is certainly falling upon the cities in terms of um, leading on the issues of the day because we're not getting the type of response that we'd like um, out of Washington and some of our, um, even some of our international bodies because the United States is 
the leader of so many of those. And because of, I think, the direction the country is going in right now, um, having taking a position of wanting to pull back from some of these alliances like NATO and whatnot. Do you think uh, it's temporary, Mr. Mayor? Do you think I, that it is this government as opposed to government? I hope that the, the trajectory and the, the, the speed <clears throat> at which we seem to be backing away from international commitments and sort of Washington taking their hands off of certain areas like climate and other things is temporary. I do think that the, the cities in our, in our country, though, demographically are just by, just by nature of where the population in our country is moving. I, mean, I think we're at the point in history now where there's never been more and never been a higher percentage of our citizens who live in our cities. So right. it's, it's just where the people are. And it's just where the economic activity is. And so it's the natural locus right. for a, a lot of this activity. And let's and that, acknowledge that in Texas today, where you know, when I moved here almost 30 years ago, I heard the lovely old myth that Texas was a rural state or a ranching state or an agricultural state. It's a myth. The fact is Texas today has, as you know, Mr. Mayor, five of the 13 largest cities in America, more big cities than any other state. Yep. We're an urban state. And those urban areas of Texas are growing. 95% of the growth of the population of Texas in the next 30 years is going to be in the 82 metropolitan counties, right? We yep. know that. So it's a state that has rural roots. We've got an important rural economy, and, and there's there's no question right. that it's, it's important. But the population is undeniably urban and, and becoming more so. And, yep. and the drivers of the, the economic um, engine yep. um, that is Texas are our cities, and particularly Dallas, actually. I want to ask you about a couple of the issues that I alluded to that might have once upon a time been in the hands of the state or in the hands of the federal government, but by virtue of them either deciding we don't want to do, deal with this or taking the, in, the negative position on those, they fall, fall to you. And I want to begin maybe inevitably with guns. Um, we had a shooting at the Molson Coors plant in Milwaukee yes. this week. Your colleague, Mayor Barrett, had to do what so many other mayors, many in Texas lately have had to do, Mayor Margo in El Paso, Mayor Turner in Odessa just last summer, yeah. and that is, uh, you know, thoughts and prayers and deal yep. with the byproducts of a mass casualty incident involving a gun. Um, you know, you now have kids who are growing up doing uh, 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 kind of gun drills. Uh, yeah. What happens if there's a mass shooter in your school as opposed to duck and cover probably of two or yep. three generations? I mean, it, is anything going to change on this? Should anything change? And what can you or should you at the city level do on this subject? Because, of course, the city of Dallas famously, July 7th, will always be fixed in our minds. You've been through this as a city yourselves. Yes. So how do you as a mayor and how do you as, how, how does Dallas as a city deal with this issue? Well, I think that and I'm a part of an organization that has really leaned in on this issue, the United States Conference of Mayors. Yes. Um, we really do need to have federal action on and making sure that we can, I think there is already widespread support amongst the American people for just doing a better job of keeping guns out of people's hands who have no business with guns. I think there's a real discussion that we could have, and this bill has moved through the House and it's sitting in the Senate, about background checks and making sure that people who have histories of domestic violence or people who have long criminal histories, people who, have, uh, who are unstable mentally, don't have access to firearms. And right now, we, we just seem unable to move on that. And that, that is something that we very much um, would benefit from in our cities. I mean, we are in Dallas right now dealing with a surge in violent crime, and it's driven by guns. And the guns are falling in the hands many, many times, we are finding, uh, of folks who should never have been able to get access to a gun. These are, people, these are multiple um, of, you know, time offenders. These are repeat offenders. These are people who have long domestic violence rap sheets or long violent criminal histories. And we have to figure out a way to get guns out of those folks' hands. And the federal government has to help us with that. So you are for universal, what is often referred to as universal background checks. I'm for, yes, I'm for making sure that we put in place, and, and there's a bill right now in the Senate right. that would actually put in place a regime of putting people through a background check before they purchase a firearm, whether it was in a 
a transaction at a, at a vendor or dealer or between right. individuals. So not just private sales, uh, which I know after the Odessa and El Paso uh, incidents, uh, Lieutenant Governor Patrick, among others, came out and said, well, I think maybe we ought to be talking about background checks, but just for private gun sales. You believe that we should do the full, the full menu of it. And of course, the polling in Texas, we do polling every quarter. The polling in Texas consistently has shown that an overwhelming number of Texans, more, more than 80%, support uh, some kind of universal back. I'm, I'm for but there's no appetite for it at the Capitol. There's no appetite for it, at least it appears in Washington. Right. Well, there's there's not a whole lot of activity right. happening in Washington on, on any front, but that bill is stalled in the Senate, and that's something that we, as yeah. mayors around this country, a, right. a, a bipartisan group of mayors, I would point out, yeah. are, are very much in support of, and I am too. Yeah, but Mr. Mayor, you understand this is Texas. This is a state that has a proud tradition of embracing the Second Amendment. People believe in gun rights. How do you balance the rights of people in this state and elsewhere to have access to firearms with what you believe to be a public safety need? How do you balance that? How do you sell that? Well, how do you sell it um, is, is a, I guess, a different question because I, do think I don't think they're irreconcilable positions at all. I don't think that an accurate interpretation of the Second Amendment uh, means that you have to allow someone who's mentally unstable to have access to a firearm. I don't think it means that you have to ha allow someone right. who has, I mean, right now, federal law says that someone who's committed uh, a felony, it's a crime for them to be in possession of a firearm, but those crimes, those cases aren't being prosecuted as vigorously as right. they should so be. So let's get you on the record. Cases. You are for universal background checks, yes. Are you for banning high-capacity magazines, the multi-ammunition chambers that would allow someone to fire off X number of rounds in a short period of time? I'm for, I'm for I think that regulating the size of a magazine is something that's within the purview of government to look at. I don't so know what the size are, should be. But are you, are you for some limitations on that? I believe that's a reason. I believe that can be a reasonable gun regulation. Are you for yes. a ban on uh, automatic weapons? I believe that can be a reasonable gun regulation as well. I think that can those, be a reasonable yeah. gun regulation is not a yes or no answer, Mr. Mayor. Well, Come on, man. I've known you for years. You're a straightforward yeah. guy. Yes or no? Are you well, for a ban on? Automatic weapons. I think that there's are there's even a, a debate about what constitutes an. Do you what's an? Are you a gun guy? Please. No, are you? So what's an automatic? You have, tell, have you met me? Right, Look at uh, me. What's an automatic weapon? What is it? What's an automatic weapon? This, describe, describe that. To uh, me. Well, well, what's often said is a weapon of war, something that you would ordinarily what's see that? on the battlefield, an AR-15, say. So a weapon of AK war. AK-47. So. Right. I, look, I think if someone wants to come along and propose a ban on the AK-47, I would be open to that. Yes. You're going to go full Beto on us and call for the confiscation of such weapons? <laughs> no, I'm not calling for the confiscation of anything. But I will say this. Yeah. I think that's part of the, of the issue with the gun discussion is that it has to be a discussion. People need to first get to the point where they understand what it is even that they're, they're debating. Uh, what someone thinks is an automatic weapon or a weapon of war in someone else's conception is is not. So we need to get clarity on what we're talking about banning first. Right. But I do believe that that's a reasonable area of regulation. Discussion. That, that, that is, it is actually not right. outside of the purview of government to be looking into those types of weapons. On the subject of mental illness, and I realize that some of what I'm about to talk about will touch on mental illness directly and some indirectly. I want to ask you about the homelessness problem in the city of yes. Dallas. Another issue that has really fallen to mayors and cities yes, to has. litigate. You may know that we're engaged in a delightful discussion in the city of Austin between our mayor and the governor, often on Twitter, uh, about the homeless problem I've seen a little in the city. Um, the Dallas News last year reported that the number of homeless people in Dallas and Collin counties increased 9% year over year that the homeless population in Dallas now surpasses Houston's. And in fact, there are more homeless people in the city of Dallas than in any, any, any southern U.S. city other than Phoenix at the moment. What happened? Well, I'll tell you this. I, I don't know that th those statistics are 100% accurate or not, but I know this. We are but not. But I read them in the Dallas Morning News. We're, I'll we're, speak on we're, behalf we're of not my happy. brothers and the press. I know this. We, we yeah. are not happy with the increase year over year in our homeless population. Whether yeah. I don't know how we rank compared to other cities. Don't really care. I know that it's more homeless than the city of Dallas wants to have. Right. And so here's what we are trying to do. Um, one, I felt like homelessness was being discussed in a silo separately from the issue of affordable housing. And I think that they are part of the same issue. Housing is encompasses every part of the spectrum of uh, of Access to affordable housing, uh, down all the way down to folks who who don't have, who currently don't have. So a it's home. not simply so, a poverty problem, Mr. Mayor. Twenty-two percent of Dallas residents are in poverty, according to the last numbers I saw. But on the affordability question, so you're saying you think it's not just about people at the lowest end, but it's more a more basic problem. I think people become homeless for different reasons, and what I'm yeah. saying is what I. Right. 
did very quickly was take homelessness out of this little silo where right. it was sort of being treated like an issue independent of housing and create a, a committee of the city council. The housing committee was once just a housing committee. Now it's a housing and homelessness solutions committee. Right. And we are actually elevating homelessness to the level of, of, of a priority along with housing. I put a chair in that, in that committee who has announced as of a week ago that we are going to eradicate veterans' homelessness by starting off with housing 100 veterans in 100 days. Indeed. So we're going to try to eradic- join the 78 cities around the country who completely eliminated veterans' homelessness. So we're going to start there. Um, and then we're also going to try to figure out how to, as quickly as possible, spend $20 million of bond funds that we have available to actually build more housing for housing our homeless in the city. Yep. Um, and so... These are things. These are things that we're doing right now. But um, as far as you know, what accounts for that increase? Um, it, it's it's something that is confounding to a lot of us because Dallas's economy is doing very well. Right. Um, and I know that we have we have a, a very robust um, ecosystem of homelessness um, prevention and, and homeless service providers, but. Every now and then, you know, something defies statistics and you don't understand exactly what's happening, but you have to attack it. And so that's what we're doing in Dallas yeah. right now is attacking it at the right. level of, you know, we're going to spend the money that we have in our, in our bond package on homelessness. Yep. And we're going to continue to try to find ways to um, put people, starting with veterans, um, in, yep. in some affordable housing. I, I want to talk about affordability. You brought up affordability. You opened the door. I'm going to walk through it. I think that's actually an interesting conversation as it relates to this. Uh, Dallas, the Dallas metro area in 2018 had the highest volume of home sales of any large metro area in the United States, $9.2 billion equal to Los Angeles. But home prices between 2006 and 2018 in Dallas grew by 42%. Yep. The only cities in America where home prices grew more during that period were Austin, Denver, and San Francisco. So you have this yep. massive increase in home sales, but you also have this massive increase in home prices. Right. And the result is that Dallas has become, for a lot of people, an unaffordable place to live. I mean, I think politically, because you yeah. and I are both political junkies, one of the interesting consequences of that is you're pushing a lot of people who take Dallas County votes with them into places like Collin County and Denton County. And we may be seeing some of the political consequences of that. That's an interesting point. Right? But nonetheless, you have a problem in Dallas with affordability that is at least related to the homelessness problem, as you say. So what do you do about that? What can you as mayor do about that? Well, I mean, I think that's a, a that is one of the things that is a real challenge because it's a it's a good thing in in, in a way that our sure. e- that our economy is growing such and that jobs are being created and companies are relocating and people want to be there. People want to be there. There's more demand for housing. It's it's the old supply and demand curve. It's right. it's driving up the price, but it is is creating pressure on the folks who I'd say have traditionally been left behind in our city in terms yep. of educational opportunity. And so the affordability aspect of this is really right. harming them. So my approach to this has been that we have to look at these things. Sort of there's a there's a, a group of three issues that work together that we have to focus on. It's not just affordable housing. We have to build more of that. We have a housing plan to do that. We're working on trying to uh, issue a bond and try to figure out other ways to fund a housing plan to build 20,000 more affordable housing units in the city. But you also have to look at transportation and I say workforce development also. We have to figure out how to get people trained to get a better job so that more housing stock becomes more affordable. That There's another aspect of housing affordability that gets lost, which is what's unaffordable at one salary level becomes more affordable at another. So we need to elevate people's incomes in the city. There's a lot of unfilled jobs right now. And people, I saw some people earlier today from the Dallas County Community College District, my friend Isaac, they're working day and night on figuring out how to get more people in Dallas through their programs, six months, a year, two years max to be completely retooled where they can take a job in cybersecurity or become a registered nurse. And you know, in some cases, increase their salary by 50%, 100%. That will alleviate some of the pressure. Does the of city have a role in that, Mr. Mayor? I mean, you're talking Absolutely. about the Dallas Community College District, which will do its thing. Others will do their things. What can you out of the mayor's office do 
to put your thumb on the scale for this? Well, I've elevated it to a priority, and I've, I speak about it every chance I get. And we are actually exploring the possibility of entering into a formal partnership, an interlocal agreement with our community college district, our school district, Workforce Solutions, which is our local yep. workforce um, development board. Um, and so what we're trying to do is figure out how we can get more of our residents to actually get into those programs. And so that the, the piece that I didn't get a chance to, refer, uh, to mention earlier, uh, the three, is the transportation piece. For many people, transportation is a barrier. Child care is a barrier to going back to school right. and getting the skills they need. So um, those are things that we're trying to figure out right now, how to work together to make sure that that's yeah. not a reason right. for any resident of Dallas not to go and get the schooling they need. My, my colleague, Edgar Walters, our health and human services reporter, in the last couple of days wrote a story about the homelessness issue and said that um, advocates on the homelessness issue are thinking that one way to deal with the problem would be for the state to simply get over itself and expand Medicaid. This is a non, not a, uh, an uncontroversial uh, matter. The governor's office came back and said, well, the governor's considering his options. While quick to say, we're not talking about expanding the Affordable Care Act, we are looking at the block grant options possibly that would come out of Washington today as a potential way to come at this. The theory is that making more Medicaid dollars available in some fashion might actually get at the problem. You've been in the legislature during debates over the potential expansion of Medicaid. Do you have, have. a position on this as mayor, whether the state should be accessing some of those dollars potentially to deal with this issue in your city and others? Well, that's a, that's pretty straightforward for me. I, yes, we would appreciate any help from any source. Yeah. So, yes, we, we would love to see um, the, the state be more um, supportive of pulling down those federal dollars. It would help us a lot. There's no question about that. Yeah. Um, on health care, Mr. Mayor, another issue that you would think of as a federal issue or a state issue but has landed on the uh, doorsteps of mayors and of cities. Dallas right now, as I look up the numbers, has... Uh, an uninsured rate of 25%, this would be the county, Dallas County, um, the highest uninsured rate of any city or county of more than 300,000 in the country. 27% of adults in Dallas County have no insurance. It's more than one in five black residents. It's nearly two in five Hispanic residents, and it's more than three in 10 poor residents. What do you do about that? I mean, there's a version of this story, maybe not as extreme, in every big city in Texas, right? So what do you do about that? The problem keeps getting worse and worse. I mean, I think we kind of touched on it. We need, we need help from Austin, and we need help from Washington. Our provider community is doing everything they possibly can um, to, to deal with folks who are showing up. I mean, they're being very, um, they're being very generous in, in terms of serving these populations, but, but we need the financial support. Um, from Washington, and we need we need a Medicaid expansion, frankly, right. to help alleviate that. But pressure. Mr. Mayor, you're not getting it. You know, it's like I'd like to be six foot eight and play for the Mavericks, but that's not going to happen any sooner than the state's going to expand Medicaid. Come on, right? So, what do you do? Well, I can tell you this: we do not have the resources at the city level to step in and address the the health aspect of this problem because. Uh, that that's not actually our core responsibility. The the county under our form of government yep. is the primary driver of health service delivery in our state. And then of course, you know, the federal government has a role to play through those large federal programs. There's we don't have that type of um, money in our budget to start stepping into those areas, and we and we can't do the things that we actually have to do. The essential services, yeah, public safety. Um, being the number one. I mean, we're talking two-thirds of our budget goes to that alone um, to start stepping into these areas. They affect us, but we ha we, this is where the, the levels of government have to stay in their lane and do their job. And so, yes, my job is to go and impress upon Austin, which I plan to do, uh, my first session back be, in, in the capital as a mayor. first session as mayor, right, coming and, up. And going to Washington <clears throat> right. like, I've been, like I've done, I don't know, at least three times since I've been mayor. To make the case. To go to, to, go to Washington to advocate on a whole array of issues where we need help from right. Washington. Is we, it simply resources, Mr. Mayor, or is it a mindset uh, change? I, I was in El Paso a uh, week before last, and last week actually, and I talked to Mayor Margo, your colleague. is one, one of the largest uh, uh, cities in the state former member of the legislature, such as yourself, who serves, yep. and he was a Republican. Yep. You're a Democrat. In, I think we came in together. But where you are aligned, I believe, is that you both oppose the legislation that ultimately passed, went into law, that restrained the abilities of 
local authorities to raise property tax revenue year over year That's by correct. more than a cap. I asked Mayor Margo, who predicted doom and gloom for the city of El Paso, given the costs of public safety and other things incurred by that city year over year, he predicted it would be a problem. I asked him how it's going. He said, kind of as we expected. I know the mayor here believes that the restraint was too, uh, too much. Uh, do you believe that you have access to enough resources through that door, or indeed were the predictions of doom and gloom on that property tax legislation as you see it uh, warranted? Well, it's a little early. I mean, the, the, the law won't kick in until our next budget cycle. It, wasn't, it didn't apply to this budget cycle. Right. But it will. But, it, you, have, but you have a sense of where this is will. heading. You have a sense of where your year-over-year -year growth is, right? Yes. It, no, it, it's going to be a real limitation. Yeah. I mean, it, it, here's, how, here's how it really affects us at the city. I'm just going to... Um, without getting super duper in the weeds on this, to say it's hard to see how when we limit our revenue growth the way this legislation limits it, how we're going to be able to keep up with the, the spending that we need just on public safety alone. Basics. To do, to do what a city like Dallas and the residents of Dallas expect in terms of police hiring. We need more police officers in Dallas, and we have to continually keep their salaries at the level that University Park and Addison and Plano and Frisco and Mosquito are paying their much smaller police forces, or our officers leave. Yep. We have to shore up a pension and increase the rate of contribution to that pension in accordance with state law on a step-up scale that's going to require more of our general fund money to go towards that. It's hard to see how we're going to be able to keep pace in public safety and also do what we need to do on maintaining our, our crumbling infrastructure. Again, where we're getting no help from Washington, we have an infrastructure package that's also stranded in the House right now that would right. help all of our, our cities. And while, while financial tools are being taken away from us, the ability to do advance refundings and other things, we could use another Build America bond program or something that would allow us to, to, to generate more debt um, or more bond revenue to do some of these things. But, you know, Washington's not helping a lot. So we are having to do more and more with less and less. And so that's why when you bring up a question like, what, what are we going to do about health? It's like, I'd love to see the entities that have taxing power, like the county, and I'd love to see the federal government that has our our federal tax dollars right. do more to help us because we, we really don't have the resources. But, but, it, but at least as far as the former part of that goes, the state's tied your hands to some degree in terms of how much revenue you can I tried in that legislation right. to put in to build in an exception for just on public safety and including C couldn't, do it. couldn't yeah. get any exception if I were it. chairman Betancourt and you were you we'll role play here I'll be chairman Betancourt uh, and I get to be me and you get to be you okay yeah. that's not gonna I get the easier job I like chairman Betancourt um, I'd say mr. mayor you make a very compelling case for why you need more money go to the voters all we're asking you to do is go to the voters. Why can't you make the same case to them that you just made to me? Because I'd say this. Number one, it costs money to do it, to go to the voters. I mean, you're, you're, you're spending money to raise some money. But number two, um, at some point, voters just hear that you're asking for more money. And they, and they can't understand, I don't think, that you know, our hands have been tied by by the state and that we're having to go so frequently because we're constantly bunked up against yep. the cap. We just look greedy. We just look like we're, like all of a sudden we want more money to do God knows what with. And so it, it, you're, you're having to make a case that is not a, a, a case that people um, and, and public policy want to have to make on a, on a regular basis. Uh, and that is to, you know, to ask for more revenue, even for these very um, necessary things. We'd like to be able to have that process play out through the normal budgetary cycle and have the elections of the elected officials yeah. who vote for it um, be the accountability, not having to go to them specifically in an election yeah. that we call off cycle for the specific purpose of asking you for so more So it's money. not that the case is a bad case, it's that the people who are making the other argument are just making a better argument or more successfully it's than just, the one. Then you game respects game, right? I mean, you got to give Betancourt credit. He's put you in a box. I mean, yeah, he's 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 the person who's figured out how to pit. You know, the the parent who's saying, you know, we got to eat some broccoli every now and then, to the parent who's saying, no, oh, pizza every night. So you Betancourt, know, those, he's Betancourt Senator Paul Betancourt, our pizza. That's yeah, basically. How I mean, you're, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's it's it's hard yeah. to make those kinds of cases on a regular basis and be successful. And and, yeah. I, and I wouldn't want to have to put whether or not we we're going to be able to take care of our first responders. Uh, you know, up to that type of 
election risk every, every, every year. Every time. You mentioned climate earlier, uh, Mr. Mayor. It's a bit of a cliche to say now that climate has fallen to the mayors. The mayors actually yeah. have been taking responsibility for the climate conversation for a long time. Um, a year ago, the council in Dallas, this is before your mayor, voted to create a climate action plan. We now have a draft of it, right? Mm -hmm. It's called the Comprehensive Environmental and Climate Action Plan. Dallas City Council um, uh, work over the last year. It's going to launch on Earth Day, April 22nd. And you've praised it. I've said that I'm glad we have, you we said have a plan, yes. Dallas is a healthy, safe, and economically vibrant city. To be truly resilient, we must prepare for the effects of climate change. Very you've true. said it. You're for it. Yep. But you're getting uh, dunked on by young people who think that the plan <laughs> is not enough. aggressive enough. And you're getting dunked on by people in the city who say that the plan was built without enough public input. The problem with being the mayor is like the problem with being the CEO of a news organization. You're responsible for everything, even if you're to blame for nothing, right? So you're the mayor, you own it. Are they right? Is the plan aggressive enough? <clears throat> Did you seek public input enough on that plan? So before I was mayor, there, there had never been a city council committee devoted to the environment. Nothing, nothing on it. Environmental policy was just being made somewhere within the city manager's office in some department. Yep. I actually created a city council committee so it would be chaired by a city council person. The members of the committee would be council people, obviously. So it would have some direct accountability to the public and then specifically charge that committee with taking up the development of this plan. Yep. So this plan has seen more daylight than any previous iteration of, of any plan or any environmental policy in, this, in the history of the city. And yet people are unsatisfied. And, and, and they had hearings on it, yeah. and they've, they've talked about this. And, of course, um, the, the reality is is um, pretty much you, you will always find folks who think you could have gone further. And, and that's probably true. You, you, you could go further. But as, as you are familiar with from you know, living around this building for so long— and working on this building for so long is compromises the name of the game. That's yep. what this is about. And so, yes, our 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 committee on on the environment and sustainability developed a plan, and I think it's a good plan. I think it's a, it's it's moving us in the right direction. Uh, yes, there are some folks who think it should have been more aggressive. And, and but you're not but, in that camp. But I'm That's not in that. Point. But I'm not in that camp. I'm actually proud of the work they've done. And I'm also not in the camp of folks who say uh, it wasn't done with any or enough public input. I mean, it's more its more of a process and more public input than we've ever had in the city of Dallas. And it's a lot of this that I've done at the city is modeled yep. after my experience here. I mean, I really believe strongly in, in a committee process and taking more things that right now are being done in the unelected city manager's office and bringing them over into the elected yeah. policy-making side of the building, which is the city council and the mayor. That, that gets to an interesting question about city government. I mean, we're going to run out of time here pretty quickly. i got so much more I want to ask you about. Go so maybe we'll fast. go game, through, game through show all speed stuff. round, actually, okay. if that's okay. Um, do you like the former government? You're one of three top ten American cities Correct. and population that has a council manager, former government. Wouldn't you like to have more power? King Johnson, wouldn't you like to be more of a... <laughs> Would you like to overhaul the way that the city government of Dallas is built? I don't know that I, I, I would say no to more what you're calling power, more responsibilities, more, more levers. I don't think I'd say no to that. Um, I'm not sure I'm ready to go to the voters and push a, a referendum or anything right now, but I can tell you just from being in office nine months that um, the system has some limitations. Um, it wasn't necessarily, I don't think, um, designed for a city that was going to be doing as many things as the city of Dallas is doing now. It's a, it's a complex city government. It's, you know, 13,000 employees and we're doing everything from, you know, we've got a park and rec department that's got, you know, golf courses and water parks and you've got, um, you know, we're managing um, a water utility. We're doing all kinds of, we're doing, we're doing a lot of things. Right. Um, and so uh, I think that, our form of government has not necessarily kept up with the complexity of right. what we're doing. And it, there can be times when you have um, a gap between what the vision is that the mayor, who in Dallas is the only, we, I don't know if, if people know this, but Dallas doesn't have any at-large representation right. on its council except the mayor. So there's one person that the people have actually put there, and all of the people. And that's you. And that's the mayor. Right. Everyone else is either representing a, a, a sliver of the city or is a, an appointed 
um, hired um, government employee. And so there are times when there's a gap between that vision that is the mayor's, which is really derived from the people and what the people want and what the, the government uh, employees in the city manager's office want. And it's hard to, to reconcile those quickly and efficiently yeah. because, because the, the authority over them is so attenuated. If you scrape the lot, uh, and we're going to rebuild city government, Mr. Mayor, you wouldn't do it this way. No. Nobody would do not, it this Not in way. 2020. But you're not prepared to call for the voters to weigh in on this. No, I think, I think that um, I think everyone needs to see a little more of, I think there's a little more education that needs to happen, and there needs to be a little more um, exposure of some of the limitations before yeah, we can have that it. discussion in an intelligent way. But, I'm, but I do want to have it. Um, in 2018, the Dallas, Fort Worth, Arlington area gained more residents than any other metropolitan area in the country yeah. and was responsible for more than a third of the population growth in the entire state. We're fixing to go from 29 million now to 54 million by 2050, according to the state demographers. We're going to almost double the population of Texas. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? How do you manage growth in the city of Dallas at that speed and at that volume? I think it's exciting, and I don't think whether or not um, it's good or bad is necessarily a, a particularly useful discussion because it's happening, because it's, because it's, it's, it's going to continue right. to happen. Live in the world that is. Because, right. because the economy is growing so rapidly, and because we, we've, we've done some things really well in, that, in our region. Of, the, the, the creation of Dallas Fort Worth International Airport years ago was a stroke of genius. Yep. Um, that, that's the second largest economic engine in the entire state of Texas behind only the, 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 the port down in Houston. Um, we, we have a, a tremendous, tremendous business community that is growing leaps and bounds, getting new companies coming all the time. Goldman Sachs announced yesterday they're creating a thousand new jobs and, and consolidating more of their operations and bringing them to Dallas, right. it's probably going to make it the second largest office in the entire firm besides New York itself. Uber's second headquarters is there. Um, I think the growth is just going to continue, and we have to just accept that. No point if, complaining if, about it if you, don't, if you and, want to and complain. And figure out how to accommodate it in terms of our, our infrastructure. And that is my biggest, Yeah. if you don't mind, please, I, have to, please. I want to go back here. No, do it. It's my biggest complaint about where we're not getting the help that we need from the other levels of government because we really, really need to just, just to maintain the, the infrastructure that we have and bring it back up to, um, you know, to restore it to where it should be. The ex not, not to even expand it would require a considerable amount of, of investment on our city that again, with this revenue cap in place- We don't have the access to those we, we don't. We, we need, yeah. Help from and the it's, federal and government. it's an economic development argument, <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, that you would make more than any other. Not Absolutely. a social infrastructure argument, but it's an economic development argument. That, that we, you would we have to be able to accommodate yeah. this growth. All right. I want to talk about the 2020 election cycle, and then I want to talk briefly about the 21 session before we go to the audience. Yeah. Does it matter to the city of Dallas who is president one year from today? Of course. Of course it matters. Why? Well, I mean, who, who the president is, I think, um, will, will determine a lot about whether or not we actually get some of this movement out of Washington on some of these things. Like, this, like we, we need, for example, there's an infrastructure bill in Washington right now that would um, free up billions of dollars and actually distribute it to the states, hopefully in a way that would localize that money so we wouldn't have to spend it on a bunch of highways. We'd actually spend yeah. it on, on, on transit and some of the things that we need in our cities. But we have to have the signal from the White House right. that, that to the Senate that's okay to move that that legislation. It's got bipartisan support, but it's kind of it's okay. kind of stuck. So, so my so, mayor Steve Adler uh, has endorsed and endorsed very long ago. In fact, introduced Mayor Buttigieg as a candidate. We'll see what happens after Tuesday mm -hmm. next week. Um, mayor Turner, who has been very reluctant in my experience to endorse people, has he over year over the years for pre uh, sure. Mayor Turner is not a big endorser. It was notable that Mayor Turner endorsed despite stop and frisk, Mayor Bloomberg. From what I can tell, you have not made an endorsement in the presidential race. Is that right? That is correct. Do it now. <laughs> look, look, look everybody in the eye. Tuesday's coming up. The, city, the citizens of Dallas, 1.3 million plus, would like to know who their mayor is supporting for president. Do it now. I'll just sit here and stare at you. Uh, <laughs> I won't be making an endorsement in the presidential race. Have you I, voted already? No. 
Well, are you are going to vote? I am. Okay. I've, I have not missed an election since I since You're going to vote on election day? Vote. Because uh, today's the last day of voting? I'm going to vote on election day. Itself. But you're not going to tell us who you're going to vote for? No, sir. Will you tell us who you're not going to vote for? No, I won't do that. I won't, I won't do that either. But um, I, right. I, will tell you, I will tell you this. It, it, it matters um, to Dallas because we do need more action out of Washington. But, um, you know, I think it's important that we keep nonpartisan offices nonpartisan. I really do think Are you going to vote for the president to reelect the president? I, I'm not telling you who I'm voting for, but I will tell you this. Yeah. I mean, if, if you will let me, I will tell you. I do think that that's one of the best things we've got going in local government, and we need to keep it that non way. Nonpartisan The nonpartisan aspect of it. So you criticize Mayor Turner and Mayor Adler for getting off the sidelines? No, they, they, they are choosing to govern the way they want to govern, and they, I, I hope, uh, feel like they're endorsing is helping right. their cities. I feel like not participating right. in that um, election cycle in terms of an endorsement um, is, is, I feel like that's good for now. Let, let me come at it a different way. Rather than an endorsement, let me ask you four yes or no questions okay. and just answer yes or no. You're gonna try to get it. Would President Trump be a good uh, president for the city of Dallas for the next four years, yes or no? He could be. If, if he, there are things he could do for sure that would help my city. One of those is he, he, could, he could actually help us with a development project right now that's in an opportunity zone that's being held up for years. Secretary Carson's a big fan we, of opportunity we, zones, yep. right? We, 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 he, anyone in that office could be could help. of help to right. us. Would, and, and, would, yeah. and, and I don't think we, we advance the cause of Dallas right. by throwing darts at people um, who we might need to go to for something like a tornado recovery that we're still waiting on. Are you going to give me the same could-be answer if I ask you about the other It depends. Three? What are you going to ask me? Bernie Sanders be a good president for the city of Dallas? Could be. Joe Biden be a good president for the city of Dallas? He could. Michael Bloomberg be a good president for the city of Dallas? Yeah, he could be. You could have told me you were going to say that. I, I would have had 30 seconds back. I didn't, I didn't know what you were going to say, Seriously, though. man. Okay. Um, he could. You have not endorsed in the U.S. Senate race. No. What's your problem with Royce West? That seems like I, a layup for you. Yeah, yeah. It's got, a layup yeah. for you to endorse Royce yeah. West. Yeah, so I've got no problem with Senator West. I, I mean, we're very close personally. And I yeah, think I he's know. Done, I think he's done a great job. In the Senate. But again, yeah. I think me as the mayor of Dallas in a nonpartisan role endorsing these races doesn't advance Don't Dallas' interests. It. Okay. Does about, it matter to the city of Dallas whether the Republicans or the Democrats control the Texas House? Let me ask that question. Well, I don't, I don't think that it's about Republican or Democrats. It's about how you feel about cities, which is why I penned that op-ed I did yes. about um, Speaker Bonin. Uh, I supported Speaker, Speaker Bonin. Speaker Bonin's to, comments Speaker. about cities on that tape right, right, yeah, we're, we're, yeah. we're, were pretty straightforward. No mistaking where his position on that was. I supported Speaker Bonin to become right. Speaker. I have supported only Republican speakers that I've been in, um, since I've been in the legislature. That's been who we've well, had. Well, I mean, but, you know. Except for the time I ran for speaker right. myself when I yeah, supported right. myself. I mean, okay, thank you. But my point, I was going to bring that up. Right? But, but my point is, <laughs> right. the, the more re for, for Dallas, the more relevant distinction is not between DNR, it's between um, those who think cities are the economic engines of our state and are places where we are you know, seeing unprecedented growth, population growth, economic growth, and are vitally important, or what people who see cities as a problem and the enemy and need to be reined in. So I'm, a, I'm for anybody who sees cities for what I believe they are, which is um, great places of tremendous diversity and economic yep. growth. So that's how I look at it. But this is important for me to say, and I, I know we got questions no, 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 to take. No, you're fine, you're fine, you're fine. But this, this is a big deal. To me, I don't feel like I was elected mayor, and I certainly didn't run for mayor, to use this position to advance any political career I might have or a partisan political career. It really is just about advancing the interests of Dallas. It's just about that. So you're that not me. thinking past so, this, Mr. Mayor. No, you know, Ron no. Kirk ran for I mean, Senate. Bill White ran for governor. If, Kirk Watson, when he was mayor of Austin, ran for attorney general. I gave general. up a seat on the DNC when I became mayor that I didn't have to do. I yeah. mean, I, I, I am not involved in partisan politics anymore because I want to do what's best for Dallas. Is this your last political job? It could be. And, but my point is this. Um, to me, my job is to make sure I don't disadvantage Dallas by something that I do for personal political gain. And if that means, you know, I have to refrain from jumping in on one side or the other in a Senate race or a presidential race to avoid alienating people who may very well be in the position to help Dallas or not yeah. based on that decision, I have to restrain will myself you jump in on help Will you jump in on issues? Though? Absolutely. All right, so for instance, should the state raise the sales tax by a penny in the next legislative session and generate more revenue, as was discussed unsuccessfully last session, but you know it's coming back. 
Should the state raise the sales tax, which many people believe is a regressive uh, tax increase, to exactly. generate more property tax revenue? I don't think that's the preferred way to generate. Is it your revenue. preferred way? No. You don't like that? No. no. What about the ban on taxpayer-funded lobbying, which was, again, a hot potato both during the session and in that uh, conversation between um, the Speaker and Mr. Sullivan, captured on that uh, tape? Uh, you know that's also coming back. The yeah. members of the legislature who pushed that last time have been very transparent about their intention to push that this time. For that or against that? I'm against that, and I was against, against that. Against the ban? Yes, I'm against the ban. Yes, I'm not against tax. You're okay with taxpayer-funded lobbying on behalf of municipalities? Yeah, I don't like the way we phrase that, but I'm, well, you, Okay, rephrase it. You, yeah. do, 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 phrase it in a better way. I was opposed to this when I was a member, and I'm certainly opposed to it now as a mayor, and I'll tell you why. I just... Why are we singling out municipalities for not being able to go and fend for themselves down there with the best and the most talented advocates when all the other interests who actually find themselves in, in you know, a counterparty position to cities oftentimes aren't going to be restrained? No, right. no, no one's going to go down there and tell the cable companies that they're not allowed to have lobbyists. And trust me, we have divergent interests often with those types of entities. So it, to me, it's just about fundamental fairness. I mean— right. If there were no such, if they're if they're going to ban lobbying, that's a more interesting conversation altogether. Lobbying so, period. Period. If they're going to ban, that's a more interesting conversation. Seriously, than all the restaurants on Congress yeah. Avenue would close. Right. You that's can't it. do that. And, right. and, and, and of course, and of right. course, I think that's 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 a ridiculous proposition. But the point is, is that that's at least a more that's at least a more fair and equitable proposition than saying we're going to take municipalities and tell them they uniquely are not allowed to go to Austin and, and defend their interests. Which, right. by the way, is another way of saying. Spend more of your limited resources on having a full-time internal person to do this for you, yep. right? Spend more money you don't right. have to have someone on salary year-round to do this. My last question. If you cared about public education and property taxes in the last session, this was a session for you. If you cared about any other issue, higher ed, health care, go down the list. You jumped up and down, waved your arms, stamped your feet. Nobody paid attention to you, which in some ways is good because not being paid attention to is the same as being left alone. I acknowledge that. Everybody is heading into the 21 session thinking it's going to be a blank session. I had Commissioner Keller up here on stage a couple weeks ago. It's going to be a higher ed session. The literal next day, Representative Craig Goldman sat up here and said, it's going to be a health care session. It can't be both. Legislature can't walk and chew gum at the same time. Come on. And there's not enough resources for it to be both. It's got to be one. Which should it be or should it be something else? If next session is a blank session, fill in the blank. What should it be? I'd like to see it be a, a workforce session where we actually come up with a statewide approach and put some real money into developing our state's workforce. I think we got to wake up at some point and realize there are large segments, large urban yeah. and rural parts of our state that if we look 10 years in the future, they are currently occupying jobs that won't even exist in 10, w 20 Wouldn't years. the state push back and say we have historically low unemployment? What part of that don't you understand? Yeah. That, I think you might have missed what I was getting at there. Full employment in a job that won't exist in 10 to 20 years. So you think the issue isn't what the economy looks like, what the workforce looks like now. It's that things are going to change. Correct. It's and that, that's going to be a problem. I think we are completely right. missing the wh where this thing is all headed. This, The impact of automation, AI, yeah. Uh, production, uh, you know, pro productivity advances and things are going to displace literally thousands and thousands and thousands of tens. And that's where the focus should be. Yeah. And that's where they, we should right. think about. Let's take a couple of questions before we go. Hands up. Sir, here, and then we'll go over here. Yes. Mr. Mayor, earlier this month, the Dallas Morning News reported that a contract dispute between two public mental health agencies in Dallas County could leave thousands, tens of thousands of vulnerable Dallas County residents without care. And Dallas doesn't have a state psychiatric hospital in the way that Austin, San Antonio, and Houston do. What role should the legislature play and what is your administration doing to ensure access to mental health care for vulnerable residents? Again, you know, the, the city's role on, on anything health-related is just limited, but I do think that we have to join with our friends in the Dallas delegation and particularly UT Southwestern and some of our health providers and actually zealously advocate. I did this as a legislator and I was the chair of the delegation. I'm going to do it as mayor. Um, we've got to advocate for, for uh, appropriation for a mental health facility to be built in Dallas, which is something that kind of got thrown together at the last minute, I'd say, last session. We need to have that in the, in the legislative agenda and in the package early this time and go down there and push for that because you're, you're, you're absolutely right. We just don't, we don't, we don't, have, the, we don't have the facilities 
to, to do that. Parkland is doing its part, but Parkland is, is, is limited in beds and things. So we, we need an appropriation for that, and we need to get it into the legislative um, request process early. So, and I would be an advocate for that as a mayor, just like I was as a legislator. Sir. I really appreciate uh, you mentioning the connection between housing and the homelessness problem. Um, since you mentioned that about two thirds of the budget goes to public safety, what yeah. similarly can the city do to recognize the connection between like early childhood literacy and public safety? Uh, so many people we see, um, the state focuses on third grade with the star test and all that. But many times, right. children are being left behind much earlier than that. Right. Um, and if they, if they aren't getting to that reading literacy rate right. by then, they're going to end up in the public safety system. Of course, we, we yeah. finally saw something last session that I never expected, and that is the legislature, this legislature, embracing full-day pre-K. It was godless socialism like five minutes ago, right? <laughs> You're talking to the one person who actually has all of the scars from those early battles right. where I was like, carrying the flag by myself. On that, so you, it's a great question. I will tell you, there's there's no fiercer advocate for early childhood education in in the state than than me. I mean, I, I actually was the one, like I said, carrying legislation yep. where I was, you know, at odds with the governor over over the role that the state should be playing in that space. Again, we're up against some limitations at the city in terms of what we can directly fund. But here's what I've been doing that's actually somewhat unprecedented, to be honest with you. Uh, I meet so frequently with the the, the superintendent of Dallas ISD that even he's commented on, we, I, I've never had a relationship like this with a, with a mayor of Dallas before in terms of how frequently we meet and, and the length and depth of those conversations. Yep. Uh, we want to make sure that we are lockstep with the school district and that we're doing everything we possibly can to show support for the investments that they're making in early childhood, and they've made great strides in that area. We're also doing the same thing with Dallas County Community College District. So we recognize the importance of it at the city, we're trying to do all of the soft things that we can do to be supportive of DISD. But again, I, I just have to be very realistic about the, the, the way city finances work is uh, education is, is something that we, uh, we try to support through, you know, in a small way through some grants and some things to provide assistance to some organizations. But the, the, the bulk of that load is carried by the school district and we are in a supporting role and an advocacy role and using our bully pulpits to support them, and which, which I've been doing. All right. Um, can I take one? I mean, it's nine. Are you okay if I take yeah, one more? Okay, okay. Last question right there. Ma'am. Thank you. Um, transportation recently surpassed um, power plant generation as the number one cause of uh, toxic fumes that cause global climate change. And uh, in Dallas, uh, Dallas Morning News wrote that um, Dallas area schools have some of the highest asthma rates in the nation and the poorer the school um, the worse it gets. And so I'm wondering about um, your position on uh, transitioning to electric yep. transportation yep. and um, what your plan is, and is that part of the Dallas climate plan? Yes, it is. It, uh, again, there would be critics who would say not aggressive enough, but converting our city vehicle fleet to electric vehicles on a certain time frame is part of the plan. DART doing um, more to convert our buses to electric and, and have a, a, a bus fleet that's predominantly to all electric vehicles on a certain time frame is part of the plan. I completely uh, agree that we, if we're going to, to make inroads on climate as a city, one of the things that we can do most readily is address the, the transportation part of this, trying to get more cars off of our, our roads. And so, yes, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big, big believer that we have a role to play in this. And our climate plan reflects that belief. And so, um, yeah, I think that's, that, that study sounds very consistent with what, what our committee found. And that's been our approach is to try to, to encourage DART, which we don't directly control, but we have, a, we, we have appointment power to a majority of the board on that, on that entity to do the same thing with their fleet and to try to get more cars off the road. Mr. Mayor, you're very nice to come down and spend time with us today. The Thank you. This, this is fun. Thank this is not your me. constituency, but here you are. Well, anyway. This is great. So I appreciate the interest. And, and also, it, uh, come back to Austin again. We miss you up at the Capitol. So no. good. Give uh, Mayor Johnson a hand. Thank you very much. Hey. I appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for having me, man.